Well, it's an unseasonably cool afternoon in Hampton Roads, but that's all right. It's not too bad out there, and it's a great day to keep it tuned right here to 89.5 WHRV. Great show for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking with Senator-elect Tim Kaine a little later in the broadcast, as well as re-elected 2nd District Congressman Scott Rigel. Uh, they both have some very interesting ideas around what we keep hearing about so much these days, this fiscal cliff. First, though, we're delighted to have Senator Mark Warner back with us today, now the senior senator uh, representing the Commonwealth of Virginia in the House of Representatives. Good to talk with you today, and thanks for being here. Kathy, thanks for having me on. You bet. Um, so there's so much to talk about in the course of our half hour. I want to make sure that we get our listeners in the conversation at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about, and we'll get to General Petraeus and all that in a moment, is this is this fiscal cliff conversation. Uh, you, of course, have been um, very significantly involved in trying to find a solution to these to these issues that have brought us to this to this moment. What do you think the odds are of coming up with something by the end of the year? Well, first of all, Kathy, let me just say to all your listeners, uh, um, we're a week after the election, and I, everybody can actually turn their television back on now and not get uh, <laughs> harassed, or they don't have to listen to my voice haranguing them to go vote or others. So uh, I'm, I think there's a great <laughs> sigh of relief about the, the election, uh, regardless of who you were supporting. Um, second, uh, I think the prospects are quite high. We've we've looked at the downside, and the downside of going over the fiscal cliff from an economic standpoint are are enormous. Um, there's every economist from left to right agrees upon that, and as we look at our economy uh, recovering, uh, but this could actually set us back dramatically. The other thing I think that's important to put in perspective here is that the the amount of change we need need to make in terms of of raising some additional revenues, of reforming our entitlement programs, so Social Security and Medicare are viable for the long term, making sensible cuts in both spending and in defense spending. Um, you know, the ballpark number we need to hit is about $4 trillion over 10 years. While that sounds like a big number, when you think about the size of our economy and the ability to spread this over 10 years, that is a relatively small ask of the American people. And the upside of this is so enormous. Uh, I absolutely believe there will be nothing that will do more to generate job growth, economic growth, and investment in America than getting this done. More than anything Governor Romney or President Obama talked about during the campaign, and if you look at China kind of actually declining at this point, India in a worse political uh, process than even America, Europe obviously a mess. America looks both from an economic standpoint and if we get this right from a predictability standpoint, the best bet in the world. The Australian foreign minister said, we are one budget deal away from economic preeminence for decades to come. So there's a big downside, but there is enormous upside. And I hope and pray at least that, you know, that that calculus will get people in both parties off their, out of their ideological foxholes and realize we got to get it done. We're at uh, 10 minutes past the hour. We have a number of listeners who want to who want to talk about this very issue. Uh, William's on the line from Chesapeake to start us off today. Hi, William. You're on the air with Senator Warner. Hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, Senator Warner. Thank you. Uh, I voted for you, and I'm glad to see you there. Um, what I wanted to say is the uh, I believe that this fiscal cliff is uh, just another scare tactic that the right's uh, bringing up. Everything's always a crisis. Someone's always out to attack or destroy America or some other uh, fib like that. But... What I really wanted to say is, this is a result of the Bush tax cuts, and uh, I'm just as upset with uh, President Obama for continuing them as I am for George W. Bush for starting them. They did not uh, help our economy. They were disastrous for our economy because we stopped investing in America. All right. Um, and as far as uh, the U.S. dollar, look, he, uh, during the recession, I, I actually worked for a couple of years at Merrill. I couldn't beg people to give up their money to invest in something else. Mm. The dollar is very strong. People are very confident in it. And uh, I just don't think this uh, uh, this fiscal cliff or this next this latest crisis uh, has any uh, uh, has any reality to it. All right, William. Well, thank you for the call, um, well, Senator. Let me Warner, make a couple ahead. of quick comments on this. I mean, we have been a little bit of kind of sounding like 
little boy who cried wolf at some point. You know, we said if we don't deal with the debt ceiling or the super committee, both of those efforts failed and we didn't go completely down the tubes. This time, though, you know, the reality of not only the tax cuts expiring, but also uh, a series of other programs expiring, the, the defense sequestration cuts, there's so much all happening at once. And to William's point, you know, one of the things we need to look at, remember, we took four and a half trillion dollars out of our revenue stream with the so-called Bush tax cuts. President Obama and all of us who've been working on this, nobody's talking about even returning all of that revenue. We're talking about somewhere between 1.5 billion, uh, 1.5 trillion and 2 trillion being put back in over 10 years. So we're literally talking even on the up end of only about half of the Bush tax cuts needing to be restored if we're going, as William said, to continue to invest in America. And that is an important point here that, you know, We cannot cut and tax our way alone, no matter how much we increase taxes or how much we cut, unless we have a growth agenda. And part of that growth agenda means you got to have the best educated workforce. You got to have appropriate roads and and bridges and rail, as we all know, in Hampton Roads. And you got to continue to invest in R and D to stay ahead of the competition. So. We've got to get that mix right. And one of the things that are positive that came out of the election is I think there's a recognition that revenues have to be part of the mix now. And we've heard that from all the Republican leaders. That is a change from pre-election. And there will be some Democrats who say we shouldn't touch the entitlement programs. I want to preserve Medicare and Social Security. But because we're blessed to have all of us living a lot longer, some of the math just doesn't work anymore. So let's go ahead and make some of those changes now so those promises still exist 20, 30 years from now. I think we can get there. And one of the reasons, again, why I'm more positive is the business community. And I think many of your listeners know I spent longer as a business guy than I have as a politician. The business community, which in for the most part, has sat out the previous two rounds of this uh, failure uh, of our elected officials, uh, now are weighing in in a major way, saying, yeah, they're willing to pay more if we can get this fixed. And we've actually got this so-called campaign to fix the debt. There's been $40 million right. raised to reinforce you know, people in both parties putting country ahead of party. And I think the last point I want to make, I know we got other callers, but it's really important. The message I heard out of the election last year, more than you know, Democrat, Republican was every place I went around Virginia and even around the country was people said, all right, we hired you guys, get something fixed. We don't need people just going up there blaming the other side, get something fixed. So that's the message that you took out. Jeff has a question as well, because everybody, everybody seems to have looked at some sort of mandate out of this election. Jeff, you're on the air with Senator Warner. Go right ahead. Hi, Senator. Thank you so much for uh, taking calls. I'd love to talk to you about this. Um, 2008, it, to me, it's very clear that President Obama had a mandate to do the things that he ran on, and uh, that's clear not only because of the degree to which he won the popular vote uh, in the Electoral College, but also because you had a very strong majority in the Senate and control of the House of Representatives. And then after Senator Specter switched parties, a filibuster-proof majority, which uh, I, I think it's been quite some time since any president has had that kind of power concentrated. So clearly... He did have a mandate, and in his first year, he did a lot of things with the Republicans, quote, sitting in the back seat, coming along for the ride. But different election, I think. 2010, you know, the American people gave the House to the other party, and uh, in this election, they left the House in the hands of the uh, Republicans. So I've heard uh, some speakers from, like, SEIU uh, describing uh, their meeting with the president saying, hey, look, he's got a mandate. We want the Democratic way or the highway. And the president's got a mandate to uh, have the tax increases on the wealthy that he talked about and also uh, not to have cuts to entitlement. So which do you see, Senator? Is it is it a mandate to do exactly what President Obama was running on and what the Democrats put in the um, the uh, fiscal cliff trigger legislation as far as cuts to defense? Is that what is that? Um, do you think the, what does it mean? I guess sure. is my question. Well, Jeff's me, great Jeff, question. Thank great you. question. One is I I absolutely believe that. You know, we've got to avoid sequestration, both from a you know, Hampton Roads standpoint, Virginia standpoint, America standpoint. But there are going to be more defense cuts. We, the, but there are smarter ways than across the board. Number two, uh, I do think uh, those of us, and I put myself in this category, who've been blessed to do very well, we're going to have to pay more uh, because this national debt is a national crisis and will affect every American if we don't get it fixed. And it is really a threat to our national security, not just to our balance sheet. Number three, uh, you know, I know there are many in my party that that think that you know, we should just ignore the math around some of these entitlement programs. I believe that Social Security has been the most successful program 
probably not only in America, but in the world that's really helped protect people. Medicare uh, works, but you know, this doesn't it's just math, some of this stuff. When I was a kid, there were 16 people working for every one person on Social Security. Now there are three. We've got to make sure that promise is still alive, and that will mean we've got to make some changes, and I've got some very specific ideas on those. The last point, I, I, on the mandate itself issue, um, you know, I was very frustrated and have been frustrated in this job in a lot of ways, but the reluctance of some of our Republican colleagues to come along and the, I think, abuse of the filibuster. But if there's one thing I've taken away is that, you know, America works better and the genius of our founders was they set up a slightly dysfunctional government that required a House and a Senate and a President to all work together and find common ground. And if we're going to make big changes around the cliff, if we're going to make big changes around uh, entitlement programs or uh, I think make the appropriate reforms to our tax code to generate more revenues, it's a lot goes down a lot better with the American people if it's bipartisan. And I just hope and pray, and one of the things that this, our so-called gang, I also think it's curious that any time you get people working together across party lines in Washington, they're immediately labeled a gang. Only place where that behavior <laughs> is kind of viewed as gang, gangmanship. But there's a whole lot of Republicans who want to do the right thing, Democrats who want to do the right thing. I hope the president, I think he will take a leadership opportunity here to, to reach out um, because more of this us against them on every issue is not healthy. And once we, one last point on this, and I'm sorry to go on, but it's, it is something I'm obsessed about. Uh, you know, there is nothing good uh, other than kind of fodder for late night comedians when 90% of Americans think that everybody that's been hired in Congress is kind of dysfunctional. Um, the value of showing that after an election we can actually put country ahead of partisan interest, uh, the kind of faith building that would have for American public, especially as we go into you know, holidays in the beginning of the new year, would be an enormous boost to the economy. Now, we're not going to get it all fixed right. before January 1, but we have to make enough of a down payment to show the markets and the world we're serious. Give us some time, if we're going to do major tax reform and entitlement reform, to get the details right, because the details are terribly important. But then have a default that is not something that is like putting a gun to your head the way sequestration was, but a default that we could live with if the so-called regular order doesn't work. I heard you say you were you were frustrated, and, I'm, and I, that has to be the case uh, with with some degree of regularity uh, in, in, on Capitol Hill. And I know that you have um, have been weighing an opportunity to perhaps run again for governor. And the latest the latest poll shows that uh, that would be a pretty successful outing were you to attempt that, at least uh, according to the poll that's just been finished uh, by Quinnipiac University. Uh, so so what are you thinking about coming back to what you have said was the best job there is? I loved being governor. There were rumors that there were fingernails, impressions in the floor of the mansion as they drug me out, even <laughs> when I was turning it over to my very good friend, Tim Kaine. Um, you know, a couple of things. One, I am all in on the job I have right now about debt and deficit and getting that fixed. There is no value add. I can do more than working through that, and I hopefully that will work through in the, the coming months. And uh, Two is that uh, you know, there were an awful lot of folks, Democrats and Republicans alike, who during this past number of months have urged me to consider um, uh, you know, trying to go back for the old job. And I told them, you know, this is not the right time to talk about it. You know, let's get through this national election. And I owe it to them to finish those conversations. I also owe it to not dilly-dally around. I've tried to set a self-imposed guideline of around Thanksgiving. Um, you know, the notion would be is it would only be could you go back to Virginia and almost build this new model that would uh, um, really show that we could get things done again. I, I, I think you know, one of the things, Washington, Richmond, local levels, that that is important, that uh, more important than partisan interest is showing again that, you know, representative democracy can actually work together. You can fight and disagree, but then uh, after that fighting is over, you can... Um, put the country of the Commonwealth first. So I'm going to work through this, but my first and foremost uh, uh, priority remains my, as some of my colleagues think, colleagues think my obsession about getting this debt and deficit fixed. <laughs> Senator Mark Warner, our guest in this half hour, and you can join us at 440-2665, uh, 1-800-940-2240. Max is on the line from Hampton. Hi, Max. You're on the air. Hey, uh, thanks for taking the call. Most uh, welcome. Mark is Great talking with you. Thanks, I'm glad Max. to see the work that you and Tim and uh, Jeff and Jim Webb have been doing. Uh, I'm a 
uh, an engineer, a uh, liberal, and I'm wondering why we can't do the fair tax, which gets rid of all the freaking deductibles, gets rid of uh, all of the special interests, and does a national sales tax, and takes care of the uh, opportunity to get lots of jobs, because any corporation in the world would give their IT to be in a place where they didn't have any taxes. For example, Caterpillar can sell a bulldozer overseas uh, for uh, uh, 6 to 8% less than they sell it now because of the fact they're paying taxes. So, Why are we penalizing All right, Max, thank well, you well, for Max, the call. Uh, very good questions. There's a lot of pieces of that. And let me be – each of those could take a long time. Let me try to be brief. The one on the corporate tax rate, I do believe we need to find ways to bring it down, but at the same time – you know, make it, in effect, revenue neutral by getting rid of some of the exemptions. And you also raise this issue of the so-called fair tax or a value-added tax. Others, I mean, you know, one of the remarkable things is America is the only industrial country in the world that doesn't have that, which actually helps you on the import side, but there's been almost zero political appetite for that, and there's been no preface, Democrats or Republicans, who've been talking about it. But it is fascinating that all these countries who talk about low corporate tax rates do have this value-added tax um, in place because they collect the same amount of revenue, they just do it in a different way. On the individual side, one of the things that we are committed to, and the president is and the Republicans, this is where there's common ground, is saying, let's go through and recognize the fact that in our current personal income tax code, we spend more money through tax deductions than we actually raise, $1.2 trillion to $1 trillion. So we can dramatically cut back on tax expenditures, make our code uh, tax code flatter and broader based, and raise more revenue and still do it in a progressive way. I believe it's very important that we maintain progressivity in our, our tax code. Um, the challenge is the rubber hits the road when you move from that level to saying, you know, what are our biggest tax expenditures, tax deductions. Well, it's the ability to deduct your health care insurance. It's your ability to have your home mortgage. It's your ability to give to your church or synagogue or hospital and get that deductible. Uh, it is the differential between capital gains and ordinary income. Are we really willing to kind of take those on in a major way? I think we ought to have that debate and discussion. I think there are ways to take on all those issues and, and at least start weaning ourselves off this overly complicated tax code. But um, it is not a magic wand, and if we don't deliver on the kind of tax reform we need, we need to have a default that's not like a sequestration, but the one that we can actually live with. And there are, again, uh, maybe, Kathy, on a longer show, we could go through tax expenditure cats, debt, debt reduction surcharges, ways that we can get this fixed so that the you know, American public can all feel like – uh, we're all in it together. One thing that I do think is important, and mm. I feel that it is important that those of us who've done well um, are going to contribute more to bring down this deficit because we, frankly, have benefited for the most from some of this uh, excessive government spending in certain areas. But I also think it's important that we find a way where every American has a stake in getting this fixed. Uh, I think we need to move past the kind of us against them approach and really if we can make this into kind of a, a 21st century war bond campaign uh, the way mm, we did during World War II and you know everybody feels like this is part of their patriotic duty and we actually could have a debt reduction sinking fund so that we could see that we're actually making progress. There's a real I think chance to capture America's imagination on this. And hopefully, uh, you know, we're, I'm working on some ideas like this with a bipartisan effort, and uh, yeah. we hope to share that with the president and others. Well, what has captured America's imagination in the last uh, couple of days, of course, is the uh, uh, surprising resignation of General Petraeus as the head of the CIA. I understand he's going to be testifying before, uh, uh, before you and colleagues on the Intelligence uh, Committee uh, tomorrow, and I'm wondering, as you look at that, I know you you know this man well, and and have um, have uh, have heard his testimony uh, through your role on the intelligence committee. I wonder if you'd just give us your take on his resignation, and and as this case begins to uh, balloon a bit, what your take is well, on that. Well, first of all, uh, I can only talk about all of us on the intelligence committee. We were all shocked, um, and it's a real personal tragedy. Uh, you know, General Petraeus has served our country with an enormous, enormous distinction. And, um, you know, the all the details of that affair and the in ongoing investigation, you know, that's going to 
play itself out. And I, for one, when, when he testifies, and I think I can s say that all the Intel Committee members, you know, that is a separate track. It's going to work itself through. I don't think that is our place now to be asking him those questions. We need to know, because he just came back from Benghazi, we need to know what happened in Benghazi. You know, four Americans were killed. Uh, we need to get the real facts out and, and figure out what went wrong and correct it. Uh, again, my hope is uh, to move this past the kind of political back and forth blame game. If there were mistakes made, people need to be held accountable. But most importantly, we need to make sure how we make this doesn't happen again. We need to remind folks again, this was a unique circumstance in terms of a consulate, not really an embassy. That I mean, People say, why weren't the Marines there? Well, that is normally the case at an embassy, not a consulate. There was a secretary, uh, or there was an ambassador in the case uh, there who was very popular with the Libyan people, and it was an enormous, enormous tragedy. The fact that four Americans were killed, we got to figure this out and, and uh, get to the bottom of it. And that's what we're going to be talking to General Petraeus and others about. Mm. 27 minutes past the hour. We're talking with Senator Mark Warner. have a few more minutes with him, and uh, let's go to Dan on the line from Williamsburg. Hi, Dan. You're on the air. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, nice to be speaking with you again. Um, my, my comment is something that uh, I think needs to be looked at, and that's the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, because even after the big bank crash back uh, a couple of years, the big banks are still doing things wrong. They're still getting caught. And just looking at BOA and um, Goldman Sachs and everything that they've been charged with doing and, this, and the effect they're having, the banks haven't learned anything, and they need to be overseen with a much, you know, much more more tightly. So what's your what you're thinking? Well, I think I got it. Glass that okay. Was, okay. Well, let's let's because I mean they put it in. All right, Dan. Uh, let, let's get the answer because yeah. I know uh, Senator Warner has to run, and I want to be sure. He has yeah. Well, let me you. let me just again for the listening audience, Glass Steagall served our country very well for a long time. And it basically said, you know, normal commercial banking, making a loan for a house or a business would be one side of an operation. And if you were doing investment banking and other things, you know, that had to be in a separate organization. In the late 90s, um, because there, we had been turning um, many, many banks around the world into kind of financial supermarkets, that wall got taken down. I think many people, they, even some of the people who are advocates for that, uh, felt like if we could go back in time and undo that, uh, that it might have, might be a good thing. The challenge is, right now, um, of the 50 biggest banks in the world, only five of them are American. So if you put this wall back up, are you really going to solve a problem? And I think it's a legitimate argument, and, and I'm, you know, I'm on the banking committee, and I'm deep into this and, and rethinking a lot of things, but are, are you just going to make American banks less competitive compared to German banks, Japanese banks, Chinese banks, who are frankly not paying, playing by any rules? So how do we get it right? Is it, is it breaking up the banks? Is it an asset cap? Or is it making sure that you've got really effective regulation? And as somebody who co-wrote part of Dodd-Frank, um, and think it was you know not perfect by any means, but took a step dramatically in the right direction. And American banks right now, even with the you know some of the recent scandals, American banks are so much healthier than European banks, than than Chinese banks, than banks anywhere else in the world. And that is because we moved first imperfectly towards a new a new regulatory regime. But do we need to keep looking at it? Absolutely, and that is something uh, that uh, in my role in the banking committee, I intend to keep playing a, a major role on. But it is a very, Dan raises a very good but very complicated uh, question that um, uh, we got to stay at. And I don't think there is a perfect solution set here. Oh, Dan, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. We're talking with Senator Mark Warner today. He joins us live from uh, Washington. He's just got a few more moments uh, with us. You know, I, I wonder if we could uh, hearken back to election time just for a moment uh, to think through some of the issues that I know you're concerned about and, and many of your colleagues are as well. Uh, and that has to do with the quality of civil discourse in our country and uh, sort of the things we listen to and the things we see. And we've just been through this. And, and uh, you, you know, all of us living in Virginia have, have sort of been at this now since April in terms of ads on TV and uh, and the like. And we always have this sort of post-election conversation about how challenging the civil discourse environment is. And I wonder uh, yeah. if you have any thoughts about that on the other side of yeah, the Yeah, I've got a couple of thoughts. One, you know, 
I think Virginia benefits by being a battleground state. It means both candidates have to pay attention to us. It also means we have to endure an awful lot of awful negative ads. Uh, two, um, I think the Citizens United decision, uh, which basically allowed unlimited money to flow into campaigns and unlimited undisclosed money, was an awful, awful decision and uh, is corrupting to the political process. And while it may have you know, technically help Republican candidates more this time, you know, it could turn to help Democrats the next time. And what I hope my, one of the messages would be is that these massive undisclosed super committees with billionaires trying to, in effect, uh, you know, just put lots of zeros behind a number and think that's going to have a disproportionate effect. I hope they, as smart business people, will think, you know, what are those hundreds of millions of dollars do. I think in the case of Tim Kaine is a perfect example. They spent $30 million, didn't move the needle, and I think we need to come back and solve that. Third thing, and this again will will probably get me um, you know, not happy with all, you know, for Democrats were more successful, and I'm proud of that. I'm a, but, you know, our country functions better when we have two competitive, more moderate political parties. And, um, I, you know, I think it's it's healthy when we have uh, you know, parties that are, you know, are not having kind of extreme views. And I think that one of the thing, not so much maybe in Virginia, but, you know, one of the challenges you had candidates that came out of, uh, you know, candidates in Missouri and in Indiana and others uh, that had, you know, not 21st century views, but maybe 18th century views on things like women and others. And that is a huge, huge turnoff. And, uh, um, you know, uh, not for me to give advice to the other party, but having a uh, a nominating process that brings in more mainstream folks, um, I think would help the tenor of the debate. And again, if 2010 was an election where people were angry and kind of let's, let's throw up, throw up their people that are go up and just kind of, you know, stick wheels in the spoke, that sure as heck didn't work. 2012, I think was an election that said, let's get people who will work across party lines and get stuff done. Well, we wish you well with that. Jenny posting on our Facebook page, please let them know we are all rooting for them and counting on them to be the voices of reason and compromise. So I think you're you're speaking her language. Kathy, uh, can I make one last you? one last appeal? I know my, 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 my time's running out and you got, you yeah. know, congratulations to Tim Kaine, congratulations to Scott Ridgell. Um, you know, for your listening audience, you know, as we get to a plan, it's probably not going to be perfect, but, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good on this. We need to hear from you because unfortunately, uh, you know, this is going to require compromise, sacrifice. And when we have those kind of things put out, all we hear from are folks that say, you know, don't touch mine. So uh, please, uh, Jenny and others, reinforce that message uh, and let us know. We, we work for you guys. All right. Senator Mark Warner, thanks again for joining us and, uh, and best of success in the, in the effort toward avoiding that fiscal cliff. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Take care now. Bye-bye.